and welcome. This is J.D. Schmidt here, and uh, the, today we've got a great opportunity to uh, talk with Lex Ross, president of product development at Aquila. Uh, this is a brand that you've conceived based on your industry experience and successes, Lex. Uh, if you would, tell us a little bit about your background and where you came from. Yeah, hey, J.D., uh, pleasure to be here, and uh... Um, yeah, going to be looking forward to talking about Akiva and uh, been been a fun fun ride. So happy Thank to you. share it with folks. So, um, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, just you know, my background is basically uh, born born and bred in South Africa. So um, started sailing, boating. I did my first sailboat race when I was four years old. So I've been uh, pretty much in boating all my life. Uh, I did. Uh, Grew up doing rowing, so you know, crew boat and things like that. Lots of sports, and from 15 until now, it's, it's scary to think how long that is. But that actually puts me this year at uh, 50 years in uh, in in the in the boating industry. So, <laughs> so long history. Around a while. <laughs> Catamarans. I, you know, I, I messed around as a kid, as a very young kid, probably 10 years old, with putting little electrical airplane motors on little car catamarans that I. I built and figured back then that I mean these things, this little boat that I built was fast, 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 and I, you know, I always. Then I got into you know minor hull sailboat racing, did a lot of that, went to various world championships and a few things like that. But I also sailed uh, the old Shearwater Cats and Flying Kittens and Tornado when that first came out, and then also a couple of power boats, which was the old Hydrofoil Power Cats. Uh, well. Hydrofoil power boats, which was fundamentally a, a, a catamaran, really, because it just ran on two little sponsons. Um, right, right. But you know, just I was always impressed with the performance of that. But I was sort of locked in the sailboat game, somewhat. Um, and then uh, I, I worked. I imported Beneteau boats into South Africa, actually, at one stage as well. And then I ended up working for Beneteau in France, and um, also helped set up their factory in. Um, in the uh, US um, and uh, sort of, yeah, headed up the whole product development. So I moved my family to France, then to the States. So, you know, that's other pretty cool thing, sort of experiencing the boating industry in different uh, different continents, definitely different thoughts, you know, sort of uh, thoughts on what good boats are and, you know, what boats should be. So, but I ended up after Beneteau, I'd, I'd, built a very good relationship with the, the folks at the moorings which is um you know at the time was the biggest uh charter boat in this uh, charter boat company in the world and got to know charlie carey actually very well and um he was the founder of the moorings and then i ended up joining moorings in florida we you know from Benito i was selling boats to them um and then ended up working for moorings where i ended up being ceo for quite a number for about 10 years. But in that time, when I joined the moorings, I realized everything was about minor holes at that stage. And really, um, my passion for catamarans, I had the ability to really sort of sit back and say, and you know, moorings wasn't the first boat with some cats. They actually had some catamarans already, but the, what really attracted me there was the more I spoke to folks about, you know, particularly customers that had been out and that, and they, they sort of loved the cat, but there were a lot of things that they really didn't like about it as well. So I did quite a lot of work on that initially, and then I said, okay, I, I can figure this out. Is um, you know, I mean, fundamentally, the cats they had engines that were too small. Um, they had the galley down in the hull. You know, they had the main sheet traveler in the cockpit. But not really people friendly, I would say. You know, typically on a charter right. boat, you would be, you know, you'd be out with a with a family, maybe one or two folks that can sail, and the rest can't sail. They're there for a vacation. You know, they're just gonna. So, so you want a platform that really works out super, super well, and uh, so that's where I ended up uh, developing the Leopard brand with Robertson and Kane and John Robertson, a buddy of mine in South Africa. I actually try to get various big companies, including Benito, to start building catamarans. Um, and they actually all said to me, oh, there's no future in catamarans. And this was in the uh, early 90s. And I said, well, there is a big future in catamarans. So um, 
any case, nobody would build them for us. So I ended up calling my buddy in South Africa, John Robertson, and we developed the uh, first boat was the Leopard 45, which was known as the Moorings 4500, got boat of the year. And that's what started transforming the entire charter boat industry um, to being predominantly catamarans now. But those were the very first steps. So it wasn't that I was the first one with a catamaran in charter, but I was the first one to really understand what customers wanted on a catamaran. And it wasn't about the speed, although cats with speed is about the comfort. And, that, first, um, uh, that first catamaran you're referring to, that was a sailboat still or power cap? I yes, think? yes, that was that was a sailboat. So, so I'm sort of coming around along, you know, <laughs> around to this. Well, some of the, we then started a brand when I was CEO of Moorings called um, Nordic Blue, actually, and we put some monohull power boats in there as charter boats. And we had a lot of problems with them um, because of the, the props, the high horsepower, not a lot of cabins, you know, not that comfortable. And when the engines were down, we took some power boaters and we stuck them on the sailing cats and said, just don't worry about that mast sticking up at the top there. Just, just don't worry, don't put the sails on, just motor it around. So these are power boat customers and they came back and they said, man, this is, this is the best vacation we've ever had, you know? So, you know, you get to understand that. So we started then developing, basically taking sailing cats and converting them to power cats, which basically meant taking the mask off and leaving everything pretty much the same, changing a couple of things. Um, and that took off in the chart, and that, that's how the charter power people started getting into the charter industry in the Caribbean. Tell us yeah. about Aquila and what was the original vision for the product? This is an important thing to talk about is, you know, boats that are specific for charter and boats that are specific for private boats. There's, there is quite a difference, um, sure. but at the same time, um, they actually benefit from each other quite a lot as well. And the, the first boat that we developed was the Aquila 48, which had a strong tendency towards charter. Um, and, you know, it was four cabin, four head, equal four cabins. And the boat to this day is still, you know, probably the best charter boat out there. People love it, um, but it really was very much focused at, at the charter boat. In the charter um, business, sure. Yeah, and so, so we really approached the boat from that point of view. That was the 48. Um, then we did the 44, which was actually we approached the boat much more from the uh, private ownership point of view. So n not equal cabins. Um, so we had a master, there's a huge master cabin in the front of the 44. And in tradition, you know, uh, even at that time, I said, well, you know, three cabin boats, non, not equal cabin, you know, never really charted very well. Um, right. And so we, you know, we really focused the 44, but it actually does charter really, really well. So that's, um, and, and I really want to make that distinction here. And it's very important because so many catamarans are developed purely for charter and the, the route that Aquila has taken is, is is charter is important but it is not the when we sit down now with a with a designer and that it's it's not about charter it's about be, well being on board the boat and comfort and fundamentally if you do all that it's probably going to charter okay as well we um work with the world's best naval architects um, and we pretty much say okay here's our speed range that we want to be going at um, and then work with them but, but as Aquila has evolved you know the, the 48 we were sort of like okay yeah you know 18 knot 19 knot boat will be great but clearly the demand is for faster and faster boats and, right. and we figured that out now as well with Aquila but um, you know, boats need to be need to be able to get up and run. And the thirty six, you know, we it's you know with the with with the foils and with the three fifties, it's a it's a good forty five knot. It's well over fifty mile and mile sure. an hour boat now. And uh, so yeah, we keep evolving. Let's talk about those customers a little bit. Earlier, you talked about the difference between a charter customer and a, a private customer. So I think my question would be. As the boats themselves, do you need to do something different to them to make them more rugged or more reliable for a charter uh, use? 
Yeah, no, they're fundamentally the same. Okay, there's there's a couple of details that may be different. Um, like on the new 54, we may, you know, make remove some of the upholstery that we know will get worn a little bit. But but there's no difference in the structure of the boat or the the equipment. You know, the, for us, it's boats that are in charter is, is an incredible um, test base for us because, you know, a year in charter is, you know, 26 weeks, 27 weeks of usage. You know, private boat doesn't get that in 10 years. Sure, so, Cons you know, more if, if it holds right? up, holds up in charter it's going to hold up for the private guys but I, I think that that's you know there's a couple of things that i just want to just mention on that is one thing that i learned is is that the power boat charter customer is a more demanding more fun type of person but definitely is more demanding on the customer service side and reliable reliability all of our development work they just happen to work really well in charter and we learn a lot with the boats being in charter so we we have this sort of circle that you know that uh, we get very quick feedback on and and we improve and and it gives us um you know something that most boats in a private pure private environment are going to take five years to show up um Something that's not quite right, you know, in a child environment is going to show you within a few months that it's not quite right. <laughs> well, and it sounds like you're saying a boat that spends 26 weeks in charter could te technically have 26 different owners get, or users giving you feedback <laughs> and telling you what works and what doesn't. As you say, exactly. years to get that on a regular uh, production boat that's only going to private use. Uh, I would think things like how easy, as you said, access to uh, the user features, but also the service side of being able to, how do you get in and service the boat? So that makes great sense, Alex, it really does. And one of the things that sets Aquilas apart, could you tell us, um, you know, one or two or three other things that set Aquilas apart from other catamarans in the industry? Well, I think the, you know, the, the, one of our main things, and, and this doesn't apply to all, all the uh, power catamarans out there, but particularly on the bigger ones, um, the majority of power cats out there are modified sailing cats. I see. Um, they do, and, and, and the simple thing is to look at the beams of the boats, very wide beams. Um, typically very small engines, you mentioned that so they efficient hulls at low speeds, but they, they're non-planing hulls, so you cannot get them up on the plane, so you, right. you're very limited in the speed. Um, whereas a kilo, we've got planing hulls, our boats can get up on the plane and they do plane, so that's that's a huge difference. Now there are, you know, other brands out there. Um, one specifically that, you know, I'm talking in the bigger range, but also believes in, you know, being a pure power cat. But I, th I think that's one of the main, main things. Um, but um, so I, I think that that's, you know, what 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 we say to folks is: is it really a power cat or is it a modified sailing cat? Because it, you start at different with a different hull shape. I mean, that's it really good. does change the end result when you start off from the a blank sheet of paper to build a power cat as opposed to modifying a sailboat, right? So, you know, your bulkhead position is is the first thing that you're going to talk about. You don't have, you know, you don't have mast rigs, but on a power cat, you get a lot more torsion going through the waves because you you know, and, and and if you're going to be at higher speeds, it's a very different load situation. Um, so, you know, just fundamentally, bulkheads are, are very differently positioned and situated. And so then also the scantlings, the, yeah, the scantlings of the boat as well. You know, if you've got a boat that's going to do 15 knots or you've got a boat that's going to do 30 knots, very different structural, you know, the 30 knot boat has to be, from a CE certification point of view, significantly stronger. Right. So a lot you know, of it's increased as as load. That. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's a big difference. So when we talk about the Aquila's advantages, certainly those big master staterooms, the hydrofoil and the designs, walk through, uh, walk through uh, from the from the helm to the forward part of the boat on every single model, um, and of course boats built from the ground up to be power cats, not modified mm -hmm. single boats. But how do you keep the essence of the product throughout the line? How do you make sure that it's Aquila through and through? 
Yeah, that's particularly when you're moving into different segments. You know, into, uh, it, it is a challenge, but I, I, I you know, the, the thing is that we want to achieve that people see a boat from a distance and they can say, okay, that's an Aquila. Um, I think the DNA of the uh, of, of the product, what we, you know, and we're evolving more and more is good performing, um, you know, that they will take, uh, handle really well in open water. It doesn't matter what size the boat it is, it will be, you know, people feel safe in them. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, when we're moving into totally new sectors, we've got to sort of create our own DNA a little bit and our own, but you know, the Kila brand is, 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 I, I, yeah, just, it's a very good question. And it's something that I struggle with every time we, particularly when we bring a new designer on board, they have a lot of these ideas and they send us drawings. We sort of look at them and say, mm-hmm. Well, it looks real nice, but not like an Aquila. So let's it's not an Aquila. And make sure, yeah. So you know, and working all the time to make sure there's not revolution, there's evolution um, of the brand as well, so that you know it makes sense. Every new boat we bring out makes sense. You clearly have a a worldwide distribution uh, of the product, but your design team also is, uh, you've got some spread out in the whole group, right? Your design teams in Slovenia, architects in the U S designers in France and prototypes created in China. How do you manage yeah. geographic and cultural and time zone challenge of all of that? Tonight it was pretty cool. He, um, had our designer in uh, Slovenia and myself in Hawaii and our engineers and that on board the 54 with a you know phone and skype call and looking at engine room space and making sure there's place to walk and so yeah it's pretty cool we've got in the factory we have uh, eight cameras that are overlooking all the new prototype all the new product that i can look at at any time um and we have regular calls what are some of the quality measures in place and what is some of the technology employed to achieve a higher quality manufactured product? Well, one of the very important things as, as Marine Max, what we do with Aquila, um, we actually have the boat surveyed with a surveyor um, when they leave the factory. So that's number one, is that we really try to do that. Number two is all of our components that we use on the boats are international components. So we're not getting some cheap switch from a you know a low cost factory we use all top quality switches battery switches the, you know the cables we use you know tin cables we um so every bit of material that goes on the boat is uh, is, is is something that we control from a marine max point of view and from my point of view as well as make sure that the the components that go into the boat are really really top-notch components and you know whether it's volvo or mercury um you know we make sure that we use components that are very high quality ce certification is a so all of our boats 40 foot and up are basically built to category a um you know our windows and our bigger boats are all uh, laminated glass they're not plastic um right. you know so it's it, it's so, so the quality goes right through on the boat the stainless steel if you look at our stainless steel the the welds are all perfectly polished there's no you know just polished you know they actually sanded down ground and and so you get really beautiful joints on all of our welding let's dive in and talk a little bit about the specific construction of the aquila specifically um from a construction standpoint i understand that you use a slightly different type of resin uh, and a more precise and environmentally friendly construction process. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so we we use, well, let's just talk about the resin, is, is we use the vinyl ester throughout. And that means, you know, hatches, you know, the hulls, the decks, the hatches, the bulkheads. Um, what is vinyl ester resin? So I, I like to sort of explain that, you know, there's, there's three different levels of, of resin and basically you get polyester, vinyl ester and epoxy those are really your three choices as a builder right. polyester is is really the sort of the um run of the mill you know it's a great product uh, probably 80 percent of the boats in the world are built with polyester then you go to vinyl ester which is you know it's a significantly more expensive resin 
but it has a right. lot of really better attributes to it. And then you go to epoxy, which is obviously more of a customized and also very complex uh, resin to uh, build boats. So vinyl Lester is our choice. Um, one of the main reasons is, is um, what they call hydrolysis. So polyester water can soak into polyester, vinyl ester doesn't soak into. So it's a, it's a much more impervious, um, you know, it's simply a better quality um, uh, material. It's sort of like, you know, I guess you can put 85 octane in your car or you can put, you know, 94 or you can go for the nitro. You know, I guess this is the, good, this is the 94, 95. A good analogy for sure. But I think the, what I'm hearing you say, obviously the polyester resin while used by most manufacturers, the vinyl ester is just more robust and more resistant to water penetration, keeps the hull in a better yes. condition, prevents it from blistering, uh, just, a, just a much better quality um, a resin, right? And particularly just to talk about the process a little bit is, is that, um, so, so we use vinyl ester resin, and it, it, but what we do is we use resin infusion process, which is uh, fundamentally as you get uh, almost zero styrene uh, emission. So there's no open molding. It's uh, much, well, as far as your workers are concerned, it's much um, it's much better for your workers. Okay, the, the, I sure. mean, the, if, you, if you ask an Aquila laminator to use a chopper gun or, you know, hand lay up a thick laminator of chop strand Madden resin, they, they'll look at you as if you're crazy. <laughs> they just don't know how to do that. They, they, right. they've, right from day one have done uh, resin infusion and you know it's so much cleaner i mean we can and the control is really great so like on a 44 you know we'll end up with you know 20 30 pounds variation between holes which is you know nothing um with that's, polyester that's a, yeah that's a significant difference between holes 30 pounds certainly especially in a 44 does, yeah. does, it use, does it make the boat heavier or lighter? So we don't claim to be the lightest catamaran out there. I would say that we could claim to be one of the strongest. Um, and I think that's been proven, you know, with boats, unfortunately run up on reefs and things like that where you don't want them, but you can pretty much see, you know, what the quality of a boat is when that, that occurs. As far as uh, resin infusion, because we use a a sandwich construction and the way that we perforate the um, the foam and that how you tie the two skins together that I, you know I've said to I've taken panels and given them to guys and said see if you can delaminate them you can't you you, you actually tear the glass apart you can't right right get delamination going so that that's a huge plus on that so um, and then our bulkheads also I mean our bulkheads are fully resin infused and we use different weights of foam and different sort of, you know, laminate structure within there. So, um, you know, like our biggest boat um, today, the, you know, it's pure carbon fiber, vinyl ester, sorry, epoxy resin infused on the main, um, the main bulkheads of our big boat. So, and we, we bring in carbon where we need to, solid glass where we need to. So it, it's highly sure. engineered. And certainly Aquila has some innovative features. Could you tell to us a little bit about some of those innovative features? Yeah, I, again, you know, innovation is probably sometimes, um, you know, it, it's a word that is um, thrown around by a lot of folks, but I think it's, you know, innovation and also does that become part of your DNA is a very important thing. So, right. you know, can you innovate here and then you throw it out the window for the next boat? But, so we, we've got, as far as our innovation is concerned, is, 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 is the bulbs on our, what I call our yacht series. Um, we've definitely found that that helps a huge amount on the, on the, on the yacht version. So um, that's, that's sort of, now have bulbs been around a long time? So is it totally innovation, innovative? No, because they've been around. Has it been applied to any production builder that really believes and applies it to every new boat that they're doing in that series nobody else has done that so we're the first time i would say we're definitely the innovators in that and we figured out exactly how these bulbs can help the boat so i'll just talk a little bit about the bulbs it's not all yeah. about extending waterline it gives you a lot more waterline but what it does it with catamarans a very fine entry so when you're running into a steep chop 
you don't have a lot of reserve buoyancy as it as it as it dips down into a wave but having a bulb there is a gives you an enormous amount of additional buoyancy so you get a lot less diving of the bows therefore less slamming of the bridge deck and a much more comfortable ride so it's it's a lot about comfort that the uh, what the bowl brings to the boat so that's one aspect the other you know the forward walking forward from the fly bridge again that's been around i mean there's old bay liners there's a lot of boats that have had that sea rays but we do it on every single boat that we um, that, that we develop. Is that you can go from the fly bridge in at least two ways, you know, aft and forwards, and and it's a wonderful thing when you're short-handed on a boat, you're docking or picking up anchors, or you know, you've got kids they love to sit on the steps up there, and 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 when you've got kids, you know. You can see your kids and they want to be where they are. They're not sitting behind you on, you know, and you're running at 20 knots in some sea and they, you know, everybody's behind you going down steps behind you. That's not such a great thing. Whereas here, right, you can, right. you know, and, and they love it. So, so that's a real, and you know, then we've got, you know, many other aspects on the boat that we, um, you know, the, the, the big forward cabin that we do on all these boats is, it goes on and on. Um, but I'd say those are a couple of our fundamental um, sure, you know, sure. features. Those make sense. We've talked about it quite a bit here, but I would like to ask you, when it comes to performance, how does Aquila define performance? What does it mean? Well, performance is, um, yeah, it's certainly high speed is not in what we call performance. Um, because, you know, for us, performance is more about the boat has to perform well in rough conditions. So, you know, a lot of guys say, oh, the boat can go 70 mile an hour. Okay, what sort of conditions? You know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, you know, and then even if they come down to 40 miles an hour, there's only one guy enjoying themselves, and that's the guy holding the wheel, and everybody is um, white knuckling it and, you know, right. and, and hanging on for life. So, you know, what is performance? A very good question. And, and, and for me, it's, and, and for Aquila, it's about the boat being comfortable in, you know, in, in roughish conditions and that it performs well and that people on board the boat feel comfortable and good and, you know, they're, they're comfortable. So it's got to perform in various different aspects, the comfort point of view, the sea kindness point of view. Um, obviously, it's got to be really tough. It's got to perform from the structural and safety point of view to the, you know, um, to the best that we can possibly do. So, so for us, that's a, that's a lot about the performance. Then it's, you know, the engine performance, the equipment, generators, whatever that might be, they have to perform well with, we're always looking at weight, trying to balance weight, trying to balance that. But sometimes you have to give up, you know, take extra weight to get that extra reliability um because you know going light is you know the lighter you can make the boat obviously the better it's going to be more efficient it's going to be but there's there's a balance so performance a, of every uh, aspect performance of the electrical system you know we're going more and more to digital switching c zone we're working with all, all of our new boats our c zone the 70 c zone the 54 our 32 was c zone um so every new boat we're going into so the electrical system has to perform well. So whatever it is, it's, it's right. um, I really it's like your answer. Uh, I really like your answer though, Lex. You know, sometimes when you ask people about performance, the first thing they want to give you is time to plane and top speed. And you're so right. It's so much more than that, especially to the people that are on a boat. It isn't about, yeah, there might be some desire, especially if you're going to do cruising. We want to get as most out of our vacation time as we can. So you know, to run at 20, 25 knots, maybe gives us the, the comfort level we want, but it's so much more than that, right? It's how does the boat perform? How do people feel when the boats go in that speed? How does it hold up over years, especially in a charter environment, uh, which translates, I think you said it very well, if the charter boat holds up very well over 26 weeks of use, in my private use, it's gonna be a fantastic boat and give me two incredible you know, a longevity and durability because what kind of time do we put on it there? So great answer. Thank you for that. Based on that, uh, your charter and your retail sales, 
To date, what do you think is the most popular Aquila model? Well, right now, the most popular has been the Aquila 44, hands down. You know, we've uh, built over 100, delivered over 100 of them right now, which for a 44 foot power cat, I mean, you know, even myself, did I ever think we'd get to 100 units when we started that? I hope no. In a very short <laughs> you know, period of time. Um, you know, it's <laughs> relatively been, speaking. been a wonderful product. And, and you know, the, there's a lot of good, great aspects on the boat. The owners, there's nothing in that size range or price range that has a owner's cabin like that. Now, that's the boat we've hit the most units with. However, our Akita 36, if you talk about rate of sale, and rate of build, um, our Kilo 36 will soon be passing 100 units. So um, later this year, we'll be, um, I think we're around about 90 now. So it's gonna, it's gonna steam on well past the 44, obviously being a small sure. boat. And that's such a different, um, you know, focus of a boat as well, but it, it shows that we just hit a really good spot there. And so the product line as it stands right now, we're looking at what, 32 to 48 feet. Uh, I understand you have some new products on the drawing board. Um, any of those you'd like to share with us? Some of the yeah, new yeah, it's, it's gonna be quite a, uh, a late 2020 and 2021 and 2022 is um, exciting times for Aquila. Um, we've been really busy working the last couple of years on a couple of pretty cool boats. Um, we're going to, our, our queen of the fleet is going to be our new Aquila 70. Oh. Um, should should be launching her pretty soon. And uh, interesting boat because we did a lot of uh, research before we um, actually uh, started designing the boat. So it was extensive studies quite a few years ago. Um, and again, it's a boat that's really going to step into, into a really cool place in the market. Um, and you know very very good looking um decent decent turn of speed um and then so the kilo 70 is going to be just something absolutely fantastic and a lot of a lot of really cool innovation on that but then the kilo 54 which is uh also going to be out later this year so um we're targeting fort lauderdale to show both the kilo 70 and the kilo 54 so that's uh that's Very pretty good. big for a little, you know, a, 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 a new, relatively new brand. And then we're, um, yeah, we're working on some center consoles. We're working on some um, ribs as well. So what we'll, we've developed on the Aquila 70, so I can talk about a 14-foot uh, catamaran rib that slips right up between the holes. So that's another innovation feature that, you know, we've sort of been saying all along is... Uh, you know, we believe in cats, but everybody has a minor hole uh, rib. Yeah. And the same, the same things as, you know, well, a cat's going to be more stable. It's uh, going to give you more space. So, so we're going to have our little Aquila range of uh, ribs. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be, I mean, we, we've got a lot of new products that is almost ready to hit the water and a lot on the drawing boards as well. Uh, a lot of ambitious product development. Uh, ribs uh, all the way up to 70, the 54. Mm -hmm. Do you see anyone else in the industry as aggressive as that? Um, anyone else creating that many new models? No, I don't believe there's very many. Well, certainly not in the catamaran market. I think most of our competitors are sitting pretty much with a niche within a niche. Um, you know, they, they, they don't, um, we're sort of really expanding across, but the only reason that we can really do that again, and I, I'll say it again, is is that we have the best distribution in the world. Um, and, you know, you just couldn't do that without knowing that we've got the ability to sell the boats. Um, we've also got, you know, under Dave Biggie's guidance, and we've got a great guy, Yvonne Emu, who's out in Thailand, who's been building the international distribution as well. And we've got some you know, they've done an incredible job for a keeler out there as well. And, um, you know, they also need more product. Um, so to get more dealers and, and then the cool thing is that we're really seeing, um, and, and I take my hat off to Dave and Yvonne for this is the, um, the type of dealers that we're starting to attract are sort of the more high end, um, luxury. They already carry luxury brands. So they're not the dealers that are sort of dealing with the, you know the sort of more mainstream product but really the more high-end and, and and that 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 tells a lot 
you know, that tells a lot when you've been around a while. And sure, the type of dealers sure. that are, are calling and saying, hey, we want your brand. Right. They, so, they're, they're coming after you, right? <laughs> yes. And, and that, uh, so, so that's a cool position to be in. And, uh, and, and we're so, very happy about that. It sounds like you have some really great product, some really great product under development and a dealer network to help support the sales of those products. Walk us through a little bit of the process of developing and the timeline associated with a new boat. Okay, uh, obviously the size of the boat is, uh, you know, it'll change significantly on the size of the boat. Um, sure. But I would say, you know, it's anywhere from two to three years on most product when you start talking about it or we get the green light to say, okay, we're going to go after product ABC. So then we'll, there's always quite a lot of homework done on, you know, where do we want to be in that market? What is, what, what are the factors of that market? What are we looking for? If I take the 70, which has been probably four years from the time we started, maybe even closer to five. Right. Um, because the first year was purely about surveying customers and potential customers. And, and when I say surveying, it wasn't, you know, it was a, a, a super detailed, you know, what, you know, why, why is a mono hole buyer, you know, a mono hole guy that bought a 70 footer, why didn't he consider, uh, so getting in touch with those folks and, you know, would right. they consider, and if they did, what would they want to see? Um, and then also talking to uh, catamaran owners and asking them what do they really like, what don't they like. So extensive uh, laundry list put together, which then we get to work with the designers. And um, the you know then you go through the morphing of the boat, gets a bit longer, a bit shorter, a bit wider, a bit narrower, and uh, eventually you start pinning that down, and you really sort of start locking into it. Um, and you know, then you go through the process of the, the, the design back and forth and back and forth and right. feedback from different people and um and you know feedback's always interesting because it's a um it's a um you know a lot of feedback you sometimes get of what people have seen on other boats and what you know, I think it was uh one of the favorite sayings that I've always lived by. I don't remember who said, I think it was jobs or somebody like that. But you know, you you gotta know what customers want before they know they want it themselves. Right. Um, <laughs> that that is something that I've always really tried to drive on is like, okay, I hear you now, but you can get that today. Um, so that doesn't give us a competitive advantage. What gives us the competitive advantage? So um, you know, and, the, and, and it was quite simple on the Kilo 70. I mean, there were you know, a couple of things that came down actually were, you know, a lot of folks didn't like the boxy look of catamarans and particularly people that owned yachts. So in other words, you know, sun seekers or azimuts or, you know, really good looking boats. They said, well, they'd, they'd really like to consider a cat because of the space and the stability in that. But man, they don't want to have one of those, you know, they don't want they don't want a boat that looks boxy. Now, clearly, we said, okay, we're going to come with a more stylish, more streamlined boat. And then speed was another thing is, you know, a lot of the power cats out there, you know, 15, 20 knot boats. And these guys are saying, no, they want to be able to get, you know, 27, 28 knots. So that, those were sort of the, so that was, you know, and then you go through all that and then you start creating the 54 was sort of a follow on between a 44 and a 70, so keeping the styling of the 70, right. but on a smaller, you know, on a smaller boat. The challenge you have with cats is you've got bridge deck clearance, then you've got standing headroom in the salon, and you've got standing headroom on the fly bridge. So the shorter the boat is, you still need almost the same height off the waterline as you do on a big boat. So it gets, the longer you get, the easier it gets um, from a styling point of view. The shorter you right. get, the tougher it is so but yeah that so those are all the processes on some boats we will elect to build just the hull first so do the hull mold and then run like a 36 we and a new little 28 we're doing where we launched the first hull and ran extensive tests with different weights different balance you know fuel tank locations um so if we're sort of venturing into a new market we'll we'll do quite extensive testing the 70 we did a lot of tank testing and cfd analysis as well um and we're 
you know, we've got a couple of other boats on the go with some other designers now where we're doing uh, sort of tank testing seems to be pretty much, you know, the past now and it's all CFD analysis, which is pretty, but it, it's pricey and it's, um, you know, you've got to run a lot of different iterations of sure, sure. the shapes. And um, so, yeah, it, it can be anywhere from two to four years, depending what the product is. Let's talk specifically about that foil. Um, the 36 has a foil. Uh, tell us how that came to be. Every new model that we're working on right now, um, after the 54 and 70, although we will get to the 54 and 70, but when we're doing a design brief with the designers, is with a foil option on there. Um, so we're really focusing on the foil side, but it, um, and we're actually just right now just finished all the CFDs and all the design work on foils for the 44, which we will actually put into test. Uh, we've already got a customer that's ordered one set and we'll do it on a, on a boat. And they're busy being made in actually in South Africa because um, these guys have been building foils for the Australian ferries and Hong Kong ferries and that. So we've partnered up with some guy down there because when you get to they're, they're pretty big right. foils when you get to boats that size you know you're talking about um you know in a 44 the weight of the foils they're all stainless steel that we're doing and that is you're talking about you know uh 500 pounds 700 pounds just the weight of the foils you add a lot of weight to the boat as well right. um but they have to be robust because if you're going to hit something in the water they got to be able to take it um so the 44, we will be probably three months from now, we'll be running the boats. Um, we're looking initially at um, probably about 17% speed pickup. And on top of that speed save, you know, um, fuel savings as well. So we, we hope to be in about the 25 um, consumption range at sort of when obviously there's not much difference up to 15 knots or so, but when you get to the 20 knots, that's when you start really seeing the seeing the uh, advantages of the foil. Advantage. So you, sure, you sure. can't stick, you know, run at 10 knots and think you're going to get advantage of foil because it's, right, it's right. like an aeroplane that's got, has to hit a certain speed before an aeroplane can take off off the ground. Well, Start foils to get on the, the boat are the same. Yeah, you got to get, gotta get some speed to, um, to get the hydrodynamic yeah. benefit of the foil. Exactly, yeah. So, so the foils, um, personally, I've been a believer in a long time to have we figured it out how's it you know viable on to folks that it's just uh, i think we've got that figured out now and certainly the numbers on the 36 i mean we had a customer that actually which is the best testament that we've got is he bought a 36 without a foil ran it as a little dive business and that off the keys then he said hey I, let me get this foil thing of yours and he came back and he just said i'm blown away I'm absolutely blown away by by the foils. And so that's great, a huge testament, you know. And he great says, experience, you know, he's great testament. <clears throat> boat runs better in the chop. Um, the boat already runs great in the chop. The 36 is really a good offshore boat, but it just runs that little bit better. Um, but his efficiency is way up. I'd like to I'd like to wrap up and say uh, thank you to uh, President of Akila Yacht. Uh, uh, Lex Ross, thank you very much for giving us some time today and for your insights. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. There's, we've learned so much about the brand and, and about the product and, and uh, really looking forward to the future development you've had. So thank you for spending some time and sharing your thoughts with us. Yeah, thank you, J.D. And it's always great to talk to somebody who knows what they the questions they're asking about on boats as well as uh, obviously you have got a ton of experience as well so spent uh, a little time here too yeah years so, uh, that, uh, that, that, that comes well, across very strong so thank you appreciate it. thank that. you very well, much again and we'll uh, we'll talk again soon i hope thanks lex yeah, thanks thank for you joining us. thanks for getting a, some insight on the amazing akila yachts and we'll see you next time thanks. take care